last two that were approved, Vosevi and um, Maverick. Okay, good. Just so we're, we're all on the same page. I know there's lots of levels of expertise in the room. So, um, and this is one of the things that's one of our big hospital system-wide efforts is hep C testing. Um, partly because it's a New York State law, it requires hep C testing to be offered. Okay, so we do not, it's an opt, opt-in testing, which makes it kind of difficult lots of times. Um, it applies to both inpatient hospital care uh, internal medicine, primary care, and OBGYN primary care. Actually. So they're, they're required to offer that. Uh, they're not required to actually test. So some places have changed it to opt out testing. Um, we've tr we've uh, started testing in the ED, and we've started testing in uh, OBGYN. Actually, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Uh, <coughs> Um, right, and actually our numbers here uh, in the, uh, in, the uh, in the primary care clinic here in IMA, it's about 8.5% hep C positive. In the hospital admissions, it's about 5.6% um, positive. Just, just, you know, walking in off the, or being carried in off the street. Uh, most ERs around the country are actually staggeringly high. Um, uh, the, the lowest was in uh, Seattle, it was about 6%. Um, then I think, uh, uh, um, if I can remember, Birmingham, Alabama was 12 and a half, and Baltimore was 18, 18% FC positive um, in the ER. So um, <clears throat> it's a huge issue. So, <clears throat> so we're not capturing nearly enough. Um, in our, so we're working very hard to try to get that done. Uh, we're trying to also get the methadone patients tested, uh, which is also exceedingly difficult to get folks to uh, cooperate. Because everybody says, right, hep C is over. Nothing, nothing left to do. Right? Well, we've only treated a million out of the probable 10 million people we have in the U.S. So we've only, we're only about 10% there. Um, so not time to quit yet. Now, every, every hep C drug now has one of these black box warnings on it, not just the two new ones that I'm going to tell you about, but the, all the old ones as well. Why is this? Um, because these idiots in Japan basically didn't test for Hep B when they, uh, when they treated their patients uh, for Hep C. So basic principle of, of hepatology, the, the hepatocyte can only make one virus efficiently at a time. So if you've got Hep B and Hep C both replicating, in the, um, in the hepatocyte, and we have a hep B DNA of about 500 and a hep C RNA of 5 million. <clears throat> when you take the hep C away and make it zero, the hep B goes to 500 million. Okay, and sometimes that causes a flare uh, in people who, who weren't looking. By and large, that was the, the vast majority of the cases, and that can be serious. Two deaths, one transplant, six hospitalizations. Um, in general, F and basically, have B screen, and this is CDC says, a lot of people don't do this in the real world. Okay, it's three tests and not one test. It's S antigen, S antibody, and core antibody. Okay, if they're S antigen positive, you need to be checking HPV DNA. If they're core antibody positive, uh, even if they're surface antibody positive, you have to watch them a little bit more carefully uh, if their ALTs go up. Uh, and you should be watching ALT anyway in the, uh, in the GP combination or the, the Zepatier combination, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and and, and if, the, if, the DNA, if the ALT goes up, then you need to check HPV DNA because even then, with just an isolated core, people can react to it. <clears throat> and this is the, uh, this is the, the ASLD guidance on, on this. So basically, S antigen positive, check for DNA. Uh, S antigen negative, core positive. Just watch the ALT, ALT bop, bumps, uh, check the HPV DNA. So here's a case. I was just talking to Jean about this. Christine's 28-year-old Caucasian woman <coughs> working for an accounting firm on her way to earning a CPA. She's been using IV heroin um, since she was 14 um, at the Short Hills Mall with her high school friends. 
Um, this is entirely fictional, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, she comes to her GYN for a late period, afraid she might be pregnant, asks her GYN to test her for everything. Um, so her GYN does, and of course she tests for hep C, actually which is unusual. I just got an email uh, from Prithvi Patel, who's our Long Island uh, faculty member, and she said, well, she just saw two people this morning actually in the clinic were pregnant with Hep C. Both of them actually asked, had to ask their uh, ob OBGYN providers to check them for Hep C. Actually, one was in Planned Parenthood and another one was in a, in a, in a private OBGYN. So it's something that now we're doing in all of our OB clinics here, thanks to Rhoda Sperling and Tatiana. You guys have found a couple, a couple or three now, right, Tatiana? Two so far? In two months? Not bad. Um, actually, so they're going to they're in the middle of writing a protocol, uh, and they've gotten a, a grant, actually, to go ahead and, uh, and observe these people, treat them. Actually, you're writing your first prescription today, right? <laughs> Make sure you write it from an Article 28 location. Yeah, yeah. Okay, where you saw the patient? No, I'm just writing it from the liver clinic, as a telephone Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, so new hepatitis C infection, C, hepatitis C is not, has not gone. It's actually, it's tripled over the last five years. It's not, it's not, not gone at all. CDC just um, released this in, in 2017. The greatest increases among young people, 20 to 29, with injection drug use as the primary route of transmission. So here from the annals, <laughs> a couple weeks ago, this is from actually as far back as 2014, but you can see <clears throat> the, the baby boomers here actually are, are not nearly as, uh, as, as, as active as the, the youngsters age 15 to 44, actually, which, where, in which FC um, incidence is, uh, is exponentially rising. Out there in uh, Kentucky, this is actually, and of course, because <clears throat> these are all young folks, and actually the majority, uh, anyway, in New York State, about 63% are women um, of childbearing age, under 30, um, maternal fetal transmission is actually um, increasing dramatically as well. As you can see here, <coughs> here's West Virginia, Tennessee, and uh, Kentucky. And it's like, look, look, look at these numbers. Rate of Hep C infection among pregnant women per 1,000 live births. We're talking 20. 20. Now, the, you know, the, the, the rate of transmission is relatively low, um, usually, but it's not zero, and uh, it, it's actually interesting. Maybe they, they should, maybe they should have chosen red instead of black for those states, but um, as you can see, with the epidemic of opioid use here, this is, here's the other problem. Okay, they have a few other infections during pregnancy as well. Um, so several, there's obviously, um, the majority have had more than one pregnancy, late or no prenatal care. Okay, most of them are smoking, and many of them have chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes, and hepatitis B. Look at that number, actually. 16. Yeah. 16, both B and C. So we have both of those to worry about. Um, we have to treat, we always treat B in pregnancy, that's easy. Hep C is new. So, the baby rumors are here. This is New York State, actually. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, this is Massachusetts. Uh, here's our second wave coming, and then here we are. Here's the New York State data. 2005, there was just the baby boomers. By 2012, there was a second peak coming, and now in 2015, look at this. The baby boomers are actually have a higher peak than I'm sorry. The uh, the young the young folks, the under 30 group, have a higher peak than the um, the baby boomers. And the blue, I don't know why it's not. This is not blue and pink. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> The blue is 60, 60 plus percent female. Um, apparently, there is. It's actually easier for younger women to get hooked on opioids, actually after being prescribed op opioids for athletic injuries. Um, for some reason, you know, it, it, I don't know why. I just read the article actually and said they're more like women are more likely than men in their teens and twenties to, to get um, 
to, to get addicted to, to, op to prescription opiates, and then they can't get them anymore because the orthopedist is not going to write them, you know, anymore. And then so they go to the mall and get heroin, uh, which is really cheap now. It's like five dollars a bag. It's cheaper than a latte uh, at the mall, <laughs> or one of those fancy lattes, anyway. Um, anyway, <laughs> so. Let's go back to Christine. Now she's in your office, sitting right in front of you. Okay, 4 million IUs, kidney type 1A. She's got stage 3 fibrosis on the fiber scan. Ultrasound is normal. Utox is positive for both opiates and benzos, both of which she denies. She says to remain. She says she wants to remain clean, but she can't guarantee it. She's been, you know, up upstate uh, three times, you know, for rehab, and had, uh, has had three relapses, you know, as well. So do you treat her. Silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, it's pregnancy death was negative. Actually. Pregnancy death was negative. Sorry, I missed that part. I didn't I took out a bunch of the slides to shorten this anyway. So yeah, we, we there's no reason not to treat her. Um, actually, there's the ASLD guidelines. This is the old ones actually from uh, uh, from last spring. But treatment's recommended for all patients. They tried to make amends with their first uh, screw up with their with their guidelines, where they said treat stage three and stage four first, and then the insurance companies abused that uh, uh, terribly. These are the treatment recommendations for gene type one patients um, without cirrhosis up until we got two new drugs, and they just got updated actually uh, last week. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll, when we'll talk about the two new drugs, nobody uses Simsoff anymore. Uh, and frankly, there's no use for soft teclatosphere anymore or uh, this onbidosphere paratapravir uh, regimen. So um, these the soft bell and, uh, and soft lodiposphere are, are actually perfectly useful, as is grazobavir, um, elvisphere. That's um, Zepatir. Uh, the reinfection rate in, in people who use drugs over five years is actually 5 to 7%. Um, so that's actually really low compared to HIV positive men who have sex with men, which is about 25% um, over a year, 25% per year. That's a big problem. That's a whole other discussion, actually. We can talk about treating co-infection. That's a... Do so you think that's because of some sort of, some sort of zero sorting or <coughs> more wise into you know, using uh, IV drugs? So it's about that the infection happened very early on experimenting yeah I mean yeah I mean there's a lot of young um, young young gay men moving into New York City you know uh, from elsewhere uh, I'm also about the IV drug use stuff well it, it's it's I mean it's on it, it's it's uh, it's on it's actually anal sex um, it's rough sex yeah it's it's intra intra anal Drugs, the intravenous drugs and intranasal drugs. You know, Jeff, did I leave anything out? Uh, <laughs> where's Daniel when you need him? Okay, he has a long list of these practices. He really enjoys making the list. Um, anyway, so there's lots of stuff. There's wild parties going on. The bathhouses are, seem to be back in town and the wild sex parties. And so a lot of it is, is fueled by methamphetamines, which causes people to take extra risks. So that, hence the, the reinfection. Um, so, um, I mean, there's a, most people are, are treating um, are, are acute hep C and um, HIV positive men who have sex with men. Uh, the other issue is there's some HIV negative men who have sex with men who are getting it because of PrEP. So a lot of people are taking PrEP nowadays. Actually, almost all of our, almost all of our, our hepatitis B patients who were gay men now are getting Truvada as both PrEP and hep B treatment. Uh, but PrEP doesn't prevent, doesn't uh, protect you against hepatitis C or chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, or uh, LGBT either. So yeah, there's there's lots of reasons, but it's uh, yeah, unsafe sex is back in town. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's actually, I was I was told that's no longer politically correct. It's now called condomless sex. <laughs> condomless sex, not unsafe. That must be pejorative. Anyway, so can uh, can other people do this besides you know fancy educated hepatologists, uh, NPs, primary cares, 
specialists overall here in this in this one study. Actually, the NPs did better than anybody than the primary care docs and the specialists and overall specialists. We um, we like to think it's because we get the harder cases, adverse selection, um, but the NPs don't think that. Uh, actually, so yeah, it, you, you can do this, and I'll I'll tell you the only, the only caveats actually. This was also just published in the annals a little while ago. Jeff, I'm sure you guys saw this. 516 patients, SVR rate of 86%. That's a little low, um, to be frank. But this is FQHCs, urban FQHCs, so these patients are difficult uh, at best. And this is what we try to tell them. This is the, this is the, this is the slide we gave to Jeff over in the um, um, IMA about uh, about the internal internists or primary care folks, and this is what we tell the FQHCs. Uh, I think it's a good idea to do a fiber scan before hep C treatment. Why? Because if you get a 9.5 or more, you need um, screening for HCC for life, okay, even if you get a, a cure, even if you're cured. So, and actually, I, uh, that, that reminds me this afternoon at 5.15 here in this room, we have a case conference about that, actually. Um, a cured patient, who co-infected cured patient, uh, without cirrhosis. Um, so, uh, if you're around, please make it. You're serving adult beverages. Um, patients who had HCC before, patients with child B or C cirrhosis, um, evidence of compensation, including encephalopathy, SIDs, poor light retention, or variceal bleed, platelets less than 120,000, ANA, AMA, or S antigen positivity, that is overlap syndromes, overlapping with any other diseases, alpha-1, hemochromatosis, significantly elevated ALT or AST. We had a discussion about this. I thought it should be five times. Some of my colleagues thought it was three times. You know, three times the Sinai upper limit, probably not the ASLD upper limit, which is, you know, 19 for women, 30 for men. Uh, patients with CKD4, uh, cirrhotic co-infected patients, even if they're child's A, this is the 9.5 that I mentioned, and screening for hepatitis B. Like I said, if they're, if they're S antigen positive, you should send, probably send them over. If they're just core positive, monitor uh, for DNA, HPV DNA and ALT. Now, the VA has been a model for hep C treatment and screening and treatment overall. They've done incredibly well. Um, <clears throat> despite all of their challenges and actually despite their... Um, um, their demographics, which are considerably different than, than most, you know, major major medical centers. Um, so overall, genotype one treatment in the last, uh, well, and this is this is sofalidiposphere basically, and and on uh, Overall, they're in the in the low 90s, actually, <clears throat> very impressive. Genotype two was a little less, probably because of the ribavirin side effects, and genotype three, of course, was a little bit less. Here's, the, here's part of the problem, though. What happens is screening starts to drop off. The annual rate of screening has dropped off. The cumulative rate has gotten pretty good, actually. And they out of 4 million in the VA system that is just baby boomers. I don't know why they're just testing baby boomers. They should be testing everybody. Um, they have a lot of under 30s in that uh, VA cohort nowadays. But then, and this has started a long time ago. Uh, this has started in 2000. It's about about five and a half percent of uh, up to fifty percent of them that were tested. They tested two million patients; five percent were positive. So that's actually not bad. Uh, lessons from the VA: Many people have cirrhosis and they don't know it. They have the other reason to do a fire scan. The cirrhosis is really asymptomatic until um, it's too late, <laughs> until it's decompensated. Um, so just treating cirrhotics is not going to be the issue. This is, this is the other thing we try to convince people of. Their quality of life goes up dramatically with, uh, with cure. Not only does their quality of life go up, but their quantity of life goes up. Their, their mortality from all causes actually goes up um, significantly by about three times. So this is the indirect economic costs of hep C, absenteeism, uh, presenteeism. That's being there, but being stupid. Um, <laughs> overall. Work impairment. <laughs> we have some of that around here too. <laughs> um, and then activity impairment. So our goal is to treat everyone. Actually, uh, Governor Cuomo had a press conference in February, and announcing that he wanted to. <coughs> excuse me. 
eradicate Hep C by 2020, <coughs> which may possibly be the year he runs for president. <coughs> I don't know, it might just be a coincidence he picked 2020. <coughs> it probably is. Yeah, excuse me. So we have people who are not just livers on legs. They've got a lot of stuff going on. A lot of it's caused by Hep C. It's chronic inflammatory illness that causes deaths from um, many causes. Of course, treating everyone, particularly in our HIV positive uh, uh, men who have sex with men, reduces onward transmission and IV drug users and people who are still um, using it. So infection in monogamous couples is almost zero. Uh, mother uh, to child transmission is low, but it's about 5 to 10 percent. This is actually pretty high, and, and injecting drugs is actually the highest risk. So actually, um, the Europeans have picked 2025. I guess nobody's running for president there. Uh, uh, here to try to eradicate Hep C. They've made the calculations. If they get 90% SBR, 4.5% of their patients treated, uh, they can get down to about 20% of where they are now in Spain. And actually in Germany, they can do even better and get down below 50%. So it looks possible. Here, 93% in England, 93% SBR, 14% treated. They can get down below 20,000 patients. We'll see if, if that can happen, actually. And this is WHO, the World Health Organization, um, 2030. Okay, they've been a little bit more um, lenient in their goals here. 90% diagnosed, 80% treated, and 65% reduced mortality. So we have new fiber scan guidelines. Actually published this May. Uh, it was really painful. Uh, it took us about uh, about two and a half years to argue about this and get it and get it done. But basically, fiber scan for Hep C is very good. Uh, for fatty liver, not so much. But for Hep C, Hep B, um, and actually most other diseases, it's actually a really good uh, marker. It helps you decide you know what to do. Uh, patients with chronic Hep C, rather than other other things like aprifib four, uh, strong recommendation. AGA suggests a cutoff of cirrhosis here. Mostly this is where it's, it's, it's super useful. 12.5 um, as, a, as, a, as a cutoff for cirrhosis. And then uh, in non cirrhotic patients, 9.5 for advanced fibrosis. That's where we came up with this number uh, for screening for HCC for life. OK, so let's talk about treatment. Um, <clears throat> so we basically have three classes of drugs, protease inhibitors, um, NS5A inhibitors, polymerase inhibitors. For those of you in, in the beginning here, just so you can remember these things a little bit easier, uh, every protease inhibitor is a, it ends with a previr, the P-E-R, P-R-E-V-I-R. Any NS5A inhibitor ends with an asvir, A-S-V-I-R, and any, any nuke, uh, whether it's a non-nuke or a nuke, uh, ends with a puvir. Okay, so far. Right. So here's here's the uh, the, the approved ones. Um, <clears throat> there's a long list. We're not going to go over all of them. <laughs> Nobody uses, as I mentioned, simiprevir or paratapravir anymore. Uh, Glucaprevir and voxelaprevir and, pre and preventasvir were just approved this summer in July and August. Um, Rusasvir was uh, formerly uh, Merck 8408 and uproflavir. Uh, actually, our Merck drugs uh, to be approved uh, next year. Um, maybe, maybe. There's some doubt about that. Actually, um, we're going to go over all these investigational studies that got them approved. No, we're not. Actually, <laughs> um, just some real life data. This is ASLD preview uh, in a couple of weeks from the Trio um, Data Network. Just sort of to give you a basic idea, 8,000 patients, sofladipasvir uh, use decreased from 91% to about 80%. Uh, Elbasvir, grozobavir increased to 12%. This is Eplusis, Savvel, um, started, um, accounted for 6%, it just started actually. For genotype 2, it took over for 80%, Savvel, which makes sense actually. Uh, genotype 3, also Savvel, 75%. Um, and then uh, genotype 4, sophlodiposphere, decreased from 91 to 54 uh, because grazobavir, uh, elbosphere also actually works in genotype 4. There's a 
for it. Um, cirrhosis decreased from 32% to 26%. So we did end up treating more cirrhotics early on, you know, with more urgency. Um, <coughs> G type 3 patients, same thing, 34 to 26. And then um, uh, genotypes 2 and 4 were largely similar. Overall, SVRs here, actually, this is a per protocol. SVRs, real life. Look at these numbers, actually. 97, 97, 96, and 93. Real life numbers are staggering, staggeringly good. Um, this is just a, a um, this is a, a Zepatier, real world data. Way better than the clinical trials, actually. In uh, what's the number of patients here? Uh, it's about 500 patients here. It's unbelievable, actually. Real world is better than clinical trials. Um, and then, you know, interestingly enough, um, it's the NS5A resistance. So actually, I, I, you know, I didn't put that in. Real world um, incidence of NS5, a baseline NS5A resistance. Uh, was about 11%, which seemed to be a lot lower than in the clinical trials, which was about 20%. Um, it was kind of odd. Once again, the real world seems to be easier to treat than the uh, uh, clinical trials. Um, so, and even and so, I didn't put the slide in, but if though if, if you were treated the patients, if you did the NS5A resistance testing, if you were going to use Zepatier, um, you got 100% SVR rate. Actually, if you didn't do it and treated them without ribavirin, you still got 93%. SVR. Um, so it, it's actually, um, it, the numbers are actually pretty impressive for the real world data. Okay, these are, this is the update. So July 18th was uh, Vosevi, <coughs> got approved. It's fixed dose combination of sofosbuvir, which you already know, and velpatosphere. So soft velpatosphere is Epclusa. You already uh, know that one. And then the protease inhibitor. Um, which is voxelaprevir. So we were calling it Sopvel Vox before. Um, it's actually approved for genotypes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, previously treated with an NS5A inhibitor. Okay, so resistance, remember. Okay, only a couple things to remember. NS5A resistance is forever. Okay, it never goes away. Once you develop resistance to an NS5A, it never declines. Okay, it's incredibly fit. It doesn't get washed out by the wild type. Protease inhibitor resistance, on the other hand, is almost all gone in nine months. So it actually doesn't matter if you had telaprevir or bosaprevir before. Uh, it shouldn't make any difference in your future treatment. But NS5A resistance is forever. Um, so this is actually approved for people who have failed. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, for, and then it's 12 weeks of therapy. In Europe, it, it's approved to treat everybody. It's got the same indication as Maverick, actually. Uh, Few types one through six. Uh, yeah, we can we can wait on the update. For the <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> Remind you later. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's approved for eight weeks for everybody, including naive patients, because when they analyze the, the EMEA, the European DEA, FDA, European FDA. Sorry, just watching the news about the DEA this morning. The FDA, the European FDA. Uh, reanalyzed the data and they looked at it and when they took the Americans out of the data, okay, the Europeans did incredibly well with eight weeks across all six genotypes. But, but the problem is African Americans and you know, obese Americans did less well than the, than the skinny Caucasian Europeans, so it's got actually a much broader uh, indication in Europe than it does here in the U.S. But this is clearly the go-to drug for anybody who's failed. Um, anybody who's failed almost any regimen in the past, this is this is what you would use. And we've been actually writing a lot of it lately. Uh, we've been using it. Uh, we, well, we see a lot of failures. You know, they tend to, you know, adverse selection. The MPs don't get the failures. We get the failures. Uh, anyway, so soft Velvox versus placebo in uh, NS5A failures, 415. Um, overall, 96, no cirrhosis, 99, with cir even with cirrhosis, 93. So very impressive data. Uh, and there actually, there really is no backup uh, here to this, so you're, you're pretty much out of luck. The only thing you could po possibly do is probably treat, it, treat again with the same combo and add, um, and add ribavirin. 
Um, this is Polaris 2. This is 8 weeks soft L box versus 12 weeks. 8 weeks, not really cutting it, only 95%, not 98 or 99, so that's why it's 12 weeks. Um, and this is for uh, NS5A naive protease inhibitor experience patients. Um, 12 weeks clearly was, was better than uh, Epclusa here for 12 weeks. So 194, 96, 98. 97. So on August 3rd, Maverette got approved, interestingly enough, in Europe. In Europe, it's spelled M-A-V-I-R-E-T, but the FDA says anything with a V-I-R in it actually uh, in, implies that it's an antiviral, and, and, and it's in the generic names. Um, so anytime, well, that's why we have Provir, Asvir, okay, uh, <coughs> Buvir. Uh, so we can't imply that it's an antiviral in the trade name, so they put a Y. Yeah. That, if you wanted to know why it's spelled differently here and in Europe, and this is a Y and not a I, it's not pharma marketing. Idiocy. Um, <laughs> so it's a fixed dose combination of lecaprevir and pebrentosphere. Now, it's, it is a little bit different than the others. It's three tablets, one today. Okay, they couldn't squeeze it all into one. Three tablets once a day, but it's brilliant, idiot-proof marketing. Actually, uh, it comes in one the little boxes, and you can see the pills, and you push them out just like with the Ombudsman. Okay, so they're uh, you can push them out. So if you you, you can you know you, you can remember if you took it or not. You know, it's like uh, every every night my wife standing there at the counter say, "Did I take that medicine?" Or not? I can't remember. It's like she, you know she's sort of talking and watching TV, and you can't remember if you took the pill or not. You know, it's like, this is idiot proof, okay? You just push it out, and you can see whether you took it or not. It's really a good idea, actually, because you don't want to take too many or too little of this. Um, so three tablets once a day with food. Um, it's actually approved for both mono and co-infection. OSEVI is not approved yet for co-infection. Probably will be. Shouldn't be an issue. Um, <clears throat> no cirrhosis, eight weeks. Child A cirrhosis, 12 weeks. Okay, big issue here. Compensated cirrhosis, 16 weeks here if they failed an NS5A inhibitor or a PI inhibitor. If they failed both, actually, you really should not use this. Frankly, I wouldn't use this for failures anyway. I would just use Bocetti. So don't even worry about this part. Okay. Now, here, compensated cirrhosis. Very important. Take home point number three. Okay. Always remember this one. Protease inhibitors, okay, are fine in child's A cirrhosis. In fact, they're probably a little bit better in child's A cirrhosis than in normal livers because they get metabolized entirely in the liver and the levels in the liver go up. In compensated cirrhosis, they go up a little bit, but in child's B and C cirrhosis, they go up really high and you get liver toxicity and you can kill the patients, okay? I've seen that um, uh, before, okay? That's not good. Um, I know Joe is going to capture those in the uh, liver toxicity database. Um, but we don't want to. We don't want to help them out with those. Okay, and not if we write the prescription. So don't do that. No protease inhibitors in child B or C patients. Okay, very important. Um, and and, and that's, it's not just this drug. It's a class effect. It's Osevi. It's Mavaret. Okay. It's it's um, it's, it's Zepatir. Um, you know it's, it's you know it's anything. So a contraindicated child C, not recommended in child B. So, I mean, there might be, you know, for some of us experts around, experts quotes, uh, there might be a patient where we could finesse it a little bit, you know, if they have, uh, if they have varices, but, they, but they're very rubin and albumin, they're normal, but don't do that at home, okay? We need to do that in the liver clinic, okay, under strict, you know, observation. There'd be somebody we probably would see every two weeks and make sure we're not getting ALT elevation. So the GP uh, regimen here uh, for treatment of genotypes 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6. They have a separate study for 3, but it's approved for 1 through 6. Uh, 8 weeks versus 12 weeks. This is a non-serotic without interference experience, without interferon or HIV co-infection. Um, and the numbers look fantastic, actually. 99, 99. Only one patient out of 332 didn't, did not, didn't make it, um, and 99.1 here. So this is really astoundingly potent. These are both kind of second-generation um, drugs. The, um, uh, 
But Brentus Veer is a kind of a second generation NS5A. It does pick up a bunch of a bunch of resistance mutations um, that the uh, that the class Veer or uh, Oedipus Veer uh, don't don't uh, pick up. Genotype three with or without cirrhosis, twelve weeks and sixteen weeks. Genotype three, as you know, is our toughest one. So <clears throat> um, this is treatment experience cirrhotic uh, for twelve weeks was the was the weakest. So that's why the recommendation is to go sixteen weeks for these patients. Uh, but like I said, treatment experience patients, I probably would just go right to well, Sevi. Um, renal impairment. So um, there's there's no um, nothing to worry about here since both these drugs are entirely metabolized by the liver, as we just said. That's this is the good news part of that. Uh, there, there's nothing excreted by the kidney, so there's no dose adjustments required in renal disease. So you can give it to them if they if they're on dialysis um, or if they're approaching dialysis. Just remember, don't treat them unless you understand whether they are eligible for a renal transplant. Okay, very important because um, the wait for Hep C positive kidney here um, at Mount Sinai is about seven years. Wait for Hep C negative kidney. I know it used to be seven weeks. I think it's gone up because we've used a bunch of them more. But it's in the it's in the range of weeks. Hep C positive kidney seven weeks, right? Hep C negative kidney seven years. <coughs> right, it's huge. It's about ten times longer. So and the mortality on dialysis is twenty percent per year. So you can treat dialysis patients that are not eligible for renal transplant. So that's the first thing you ask them, okay, is whether they're eligible for renal transplant or not. Um, and we have this big debate, you know, about the, the people with stage four uh, CKD, that is uh, GFR between 15 and 30. If we treat it, will the GFR go back up, you know, after we get rid of the hep C, or will it continue? It usually drops, but it continues to drop much more slowly. Um, but then, of course, their weight for a kidney is going to be much higher. So the last one we had, we sent over for a renal consult to decide, and they sent her back with a new kidney. <laughs> Actually, they didn't even ask us. <laughs> they said, here you go. We got a kidney for her. It was like a month. Uh, and so I treat her now. We said, okay, can we just wait until the things calm down with the immunosuppression? <laughs> Give us a couple of weeks, um, you know, until you straighten out her um, immunosuppression. And you have to be careful with uh, with drug drug interactions with uh, uh, post transplant anything actually because they're all in cell set prednisone and and TAC. Okay, this is the the Merck drugs that are coming maybe next year or the year after or maybe never, um, and they all look good too. So what is the holdup or why the maybe never? There's going to be a, a press release on Friday. You'll see it on NATAP. I can't tell you about it. I promise not to <laughs> not to say a word. Um, and then finally, this is kind of what we're talking about tonight. Um, this is this is the British Columbia hepatitis testers cohort cumulative HCC incidence, no SVR. Um, it's about eight um, percent. In 12 years, but look at this. Actually, SVR is still about. I'm sorry, this, that's 80 percent. This is 20 percent. So it's still about 20 percent after um, 12.5. So once you've ever had cirrhosis or, or been close to cirrhosis with a stage three, that's that 9.5 on the fiber scan. We have to keep screening for these folks. Okay, that's very important. We can't just dismiss. I can't tell you how many malpractice suits I get called to testify. On where they stopped, or they never screened, and treated the Hep C, never screened, even baseline, actually, never got an ultrasound, um, never got an AFP. It's like it's mind boggling. Um, like I said, anybody can do this, it's not that difficult. Screening for HCC and the guidelines is AFP and ultrasound every six months. Sometimes we push it out to every 12 and people who have no, no fibrosis. Uh, but it's not that hard. You can still, you can still pick something up. Uh, in time to cure it, HCC is eminently curable nowadays uh, if you find it early enough. So this is the important point. You're never quite out of the woods if you've got liver damage. Same thing with Hep B. Well, I think we're going to talk about that in November. Um, this is long-term outcomes in SBR cirrhotics with sofosbuvir-based uh, regimens. This is uh, exposure-adjusted de novo HCC incidence rates. 
So compensated cirrhosis here is, is 0.5 per 100 person years. Decomps, 2.6. So huge. It's huge. HCC is the fastest growing cancer in the U.S. nowadays. It's something that just terrifies, terrifies us. We can cure almost anybody with hep C, but if we miss an HCC until it gets too big, you know, it's really, um, it's disastrous, actually, and there's nothing we can do. And that's like the, one of the hardest things we ever have to tell patients, you know, oops, too late. Uh, <clears throat> here's the, uh, the progression of renal disease slide that I was mentioning. Kaiser does, does good work on this because they've got a, you know, integrated medical record uh, out in California. Uh, so basically, if you cure patients, their annual adjusted rate of GFR decline uh, changes, the slope changes if they have an SVR, it, it changes from about 2 to 3% drop per year to only 1% drop per year. But still a question, you know, I think I probably would want a hep C positive kidney, uh, frankly, than take a chance on a hep C negative one, and actually dropping more slowly. Um, there, is a couple, there are a couple of studies. I know Penn is doing a Merck study, a pilot, putting hep C positive kidneys into hep C negative recipients and treating the hep C um, right after transplant. So our renal transplant people here are chomping at the bit to do that study or to actually start doing it. Uh, just to start taking hep C positive kidneys and putting them in hep C negative uh, donors. Um, it's a very interesting prospect. Um, the IRB did approve it. The FDA did approve it. That pen, okay, they're, you know, they're, they're doing the study. You should be able to cure everybody. I don't think there's any reason see what happens here. But that's part of the solution to the organ shortage. And same thing might happen with livers, too. Yeah, it was published uh, in the New England Journal uh, using Zepatier, so they had 100% SPR after transplant. It was the, uh, the, uh, the pen study? Yeah. Oh, okay. I missed it. Good. Yeah, the big question is when they can do that with livers. Put hep C positive livers into hep C negative donors. You do it with core positive livers, right? Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, and the change in the liver transplant waiting list here. Uh, this is the protease inhibitor, esposeprevir, tilaprevir, both of which are both of which are off off the market. So overall, actually, uh, it's down eight percent here uh, for Hep C. So that's good. And for decompensation, it's down thirty-two percent. That's actually pretty pretty astounding. Uh, HCC, of course, it's up a lot, even despite our treatment. So this is what's shaken up the, the world of FC treatment, probably more than the new drugs. The new price here, actually, uh, Maverick, which is uh, $13,000 a month. This is the WAC. Um, so that's sort of the retail uh, cost. So that's two months, basically. Eight weeks for virtually everybody with, with Maverick, maybe $26,000 compared to three times this for our own. Now, these are not real numbers. You know, this is like, you know, paying retail on uh, Fifth Avenue. Okay, there's discounts all over the place, discounts, rebates, you know, all sorts of shenanigans that go on with the, uh, the, uh, the wholesalers and the, uh, the, the pharmacies and uh, the insurance plans, et cetera, et cetera. But this number is actually uh, pretty, uh, pretty impressive. They kind of blew away the market with this, uh, with this low number here. So. They're going to have pretty high insurance penetration. They're already preferred on Fidelis, uh, managed Medicaid, um, and they'll probably be preferred on most plans actually by the end of the year or by the first of next year, by the first quarter, um, 2019. Anyway, but uh, it's because actually in the in the in, in the New York area, uh, Zepatier has taken about 50% of the market share because of their low price, but they're 12 weeks. So it's, so it's three times that versus two times that. Um, so it's actually a very interesting time. So don't let anybody tell you the cost of hep C drugs <coughs> is out of control anymore. And remember, this is for a cure. This is not, uh, you know, forever. This is for a cure. And it's a cure 99% of the time in the real world, which is absolutely astounding. So it's a really good time to have hepatitis C. <laughs> remember that. It's very curable. You've got lots of combinations. Costs are coming down, but the risk of HCC in cured patients still remains. Okay, 
Don't don't forget about that. That's a, that's the scariest thing that we do every day. Biggest issue that we now have is getting people in, actually getting them tested and getting them treated. There's a, still a vast pool of baby boomers and an even larger pool of under 30 uh, folks that need to get tested, get treated, and um, get cured. 